ASU might already be seven games into the season, but it really doesn't feel like the season's really fully kicked off into gear until we talk to our good friend, the multi-hyphenate himself of Unafraid Show, Pac-12 Apostles, Reister or Wrong, Arizona Varsity, and probably a few other things I'm missing. Of course, good friend, Ralph Amson. Ralph, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing good, Brad. It is good to talk to you. Uh, and again, we should uh, let our listeners know, Ralph is back on East Coast time, so it's a little Ralph Amson after dark, so definitely appreciate him taking the time for the Speak of the Devils. And our, and our, you know, this is our maiden four of, uh, season with the video content, so you get to see his uh, awesome backdrop there. But, you know, of course, talking about your time back in Charlotte, you know, how's that been going for you? It's been about half a year back there. How are you making through? And is your que- and can you update our listeners on a your quest for a breakfast burrito? So um, the South is a real shock to the system for uh, for me, anyway, as somebody who's never been anywhere other than Wyoming and Arizona. Um, there's a lot of differences, a lot. <laughs> uh, and, and the main one is there's no Sonoran Mexican food. Uh, I did find one carniceria in the back of a Mexican grocery store that has like a little burrito counter. And they do an all right job. They got like a B plus burrito. So I've been able to tell a few of the other Arizona State fans uh, who are living out here in Charlotte where to go. I think there was even uh, Juan Grande on on Twitter. He said he made the trip out and he's gone back a couple of times. Um, that that's one of the tougher things. The other thing is all the everybody's really excited about all the leaves changing and everything like that. Like that's a big thing out here is that there's more than you know one continuous season, and. Uh, uh, it gives me anxiety. It feels like every plant is dying at the exact same time. <laughs> it's uh, I, I understand what people like about it, all the bright colors and everything like that. But it, uh, it, it definitely is a, a strange thing for somebody who, who has never uh, experienced it to, to just see every giant 50 foot tall tree dumping trillions of leaves all at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't typically make the the trek up to like Prescott or Flagstaff or something during the uh, during the fall. But like whenever I go to cover like ASU up in Utah or or in Boulder or something like that in like an October November setting, it's I, it always like just shock. It's a shock to the system. Oh, definitely. And then there's a million other things that are very very different. But I I uh, I like it here. We got some uh, some land for the kids to run around on. That's kind of nice. I was thinking the other day about how. Jordan Simone says he likes to go to bed by eight thirty. It would be <laughs> Every five. Time. That would it'd be five thirty Arizona time if he was living out here pulling that off. So I've done my best to stay on West Coast <laughs> time the entire time I'm out here. I'm pretty exhausted, um, especially with these ten thirty kickoffs. So it was. It, it's it's going to be nice to uh, to have a couple of games kick off a little bit earlier than two hours after Jordan Simone goes to bed. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. That's one thing whenever he comes in for our, our round tables that we always joke with them, we don't, which we'll try to keep you, get you out of here by your bedtime. <laughs> and of course you've, I mean, you've been a part of a bunch of them, you know, uh, they always go way longer than you, you anticipated. Uh, but one more thing before, you know, talking about the South before we, we dive into some ASU stuff, uh, just here is, you know, so much about just, you know, the Southeast and SEC country or even ACC country, just, I mean, football culture is so much different now that you've had about half a year in there. What's that, what's the Southern, you know, just football culture, the interest, just the, the communal feel like compared to what we have out here in Arizona. It really just depends on what you're doing. I got a chance to go to Georgia versus Clemson right here in Charlotte. Uh, and that was an enormous party. You could tell how important that game was. I think at the time, both were ranked in the top five and, uh, and there was not one single offensive touchdown and it didn't matter. The fans went crazy from the very beginning of the game to the very end. They partied all day in Charlotte. They partied all night in Charlotte. I couldn't even get an Uber home because there were so many people out and about. I had to wake my wife up at like three in the morning to drive down to Charlotte to come pick me up. Uh, and then I, I went to an ACC game, my very first ACC game. I went up to uh, um, Chapel Hill to see Florida State play at North Carolina. And I think North Carolina was like a 17 point favorite in that game and they got blown out. And I and I, all the North Carolina fans were like, ah, we'll get them next week. And they just kind of <laughs> politely filed out and didn't seem to to really care all that much about the the, the result, um, which uh, they didn't want to like, fire more... the staff. And... 
They didn't want to like no, fire the no, staff they, and ruin the and, credit rating of all the staff members like ASU fans do after a loss. Right, right. No, it's definitely, definitely um, <laughs> less despair. Uh, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't like it very much, but they know that they've got one of the top ten recruiting classes come in. They have two five stars coming into next year's class. I don't know how they did it. It's not like North Carolina Stadium is anything you know special. They're they're Jordan brand, of course, but you know it. it it's interesting to see Mac Brown almost parallel with what Herm Edwards did. You know, people thought that he was washed up and come in and invigorate the program and get some assistance in that have some good recruiting connections and, and just kind of be out there as a, as a former media personality who can be real personable. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that they've also had kind of a disappointing season because Sam Howell was supposed to be one of those dark horse Heisman candidates. And it's just been, it's been interesting there, to, to experience football out here in comparison to everything that I'm used to uh, on the West coast, there are definitely, I would say the biggest difference for me is that the experience of college football here governs the way in which it is produced from the administrative level to television mm. to everything else. The fact that people make football their entire Saturday or their entire Sunday goes a long way into showing that the tail can't wag the dog the way that it does in the Pac-12. That a few people uh, up at the top making decisions for a few extra dollars because, you know, you want to be able to go back to advertisers and tell them how many empty Waffle Houses were playing a Pac-12 game at 1.30 <laughs> in the morning. Um, you know, that stuff doesn't happen out, out here. They get the, they, they usually either kick off at noon or they kick off at 3.30. And, and that's what you, that's what you get. And, you know, if you watch it, you watch it. If you don't, you don't. But if you're going out to the game, you're going to tailgate. It's going to be a whole day experience. And um, that that is something that the Pac-12 is sorely missing. All right. So let's talk a little bit of ASU. Seven games in, coming off a of bye week. Uh, it seemed like, you know, the bye week was both good from a football perspective in terms of just maybe chance to reset. Bad on the, the, the sense that it just – that the way and the manner they lost that Utah game, that sour taste, had an extra week to kind of linger on a little bit. But, you know, one guy that we were talking about all offseason long, just, you know, the focal point, Jaden Daniels, can he ele elevate in year three? How is his passing game going to look? I think early in the year he was perhaps a little bit more kind of manny ish in terms of just maybe one read and run. I think he's made some strides, but – how, what level of strides or where do you do you put Jaden so far this year relative to your expectations? And has he made necessarily the, the leaps forward or the step taking the steps forward that you expected him from this season? I don't think I have to answer that. I think the numbers answer that. This is a, a this is a quarterback who was supposed to be transcendent, was supposed to help Arizona State reach the promised land, potentially make their first Rose Bowl since the magical nineteen ninety six season. Um right now, uh you couldn't even you you couldn't even be taken seriously trying to compare what he strung together in his Arizona State career with what Taylor Kelly did or Mike Bergovici did, um, you know, or or even having a really great one off like Brock Osweiler. Like hey, he's not even in that conversation yet, and I think that's the biggest disappointment. And we can place blame in a million different places, but that's not something you ever had to do with any of those other quarterbacks. They would elevate the play of everybody else around them. And I don't necessarily think that that's Jaden Daniels thing. I think that he is a special talent in it of itself, um, but they would need more from him as, um, as a leader. They would need more from him as a playmaker to even be in the conversation with some of the people who, garnered favor amongst Arizona State fans during mediocre campaigns. And this is a team that's five and two with a junior quarterback uh, who the whole team loves. It, you know, and so that it feels weird saying that that this season they could ultimately end up having more success than a lot of those prior quarterbacks, but you wouldn't be able to look at the production of Jaden Daniels on the field and and have it be comparable to to a lot of those other guys. And so I think that if that was the expectation that a lot of people came into the season with, that Jaden Daniels was going to be special, um, set apart at the quarterback position in the history of Arizona State Sun Devil football, you're probably experiencing some disappointment right now, and that's understandable. You extrapolate what he's done so far this season out to a 13-game year. I mean, he's not even going to reach 20 touchdown passes. He might not reach 2,500 yards passing. He might get to 700 yards rushing, but a lot of that is, you know, coming from a place of, of, of maybe taking off a little bit too early. There are not a lot of designed runs 
uh, in, in what Arizona state is, is putting together. You know, it's not like Oregon last year that was like, Hey, Tyler shut, go run the ball 15 times, yeah. even though you're very clearly a pocket passer, you know, a, lo a lot of what Jaden Daniels has to do just involves, you know, get, getting into open space when he, when he can't find anybody or, or something like that. And so, I. Uh, if you go back and you listen to all the preseason prediction shows, whether it was Devil's Digest or 24-7 or anybody else that had anything, you know, th there, there, there wouldn't have been anybody that would have said like, oh, this is going to be a 2,400-yard, 15-touchdown campaign for Jaden Daniels in a fully healthy season. Just wouldn't have happened, and that's the truth. So flipping over to defense, and let's talk about a guy that you have a long history with, Chase Lucas. Uh, to see what he's been able to do, over his career, the growth that he's had both on the field and off the field. Uh, unfortunately, a little bit banged up for him uh, in the, coming back in this final season, missed a couple games. It sounds like he's going to be good to go uh, when ASU takes on Wazoo. Uh, where do you evaluate his career? Where do you put him in terms of maybe the all-time you know, local Sun Devils? Maybe not in terms of a guy who filled up uh, you know, his mantle with you know prestigious awards or honors or something like that, but just a guy who, what he meant to this program, the embodiment of the kind of home, the the uh, hometown hero, and a guy who perhaps you know made those strides, you know, is, is great off the field as he did on. Yeah, he's a, he's a unicorn. I think that he is the uh, he's the epitome of what you would expect a collegiate athlete to be. Um, Chase Luke is personally somebody who means a lot to me, so it's hard for me to speak on 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 him and his experience objectively because I covered him. I was at his very first uh, game as a high school player when he Wally pipped the the running back in front of him and went on to have a really uh, special career. We're from the same uh, neighborhood, you know. I, I I know his family and I knew his aunt that passed away. Um, I want nothing for Chase Lucas, but for his grandkids to not have to worry to pay pay for college. So, I mean, I openly root for him and that's not something I'm ashamed of, but we're, I think we're kind of in a day and age where you expect somebody who's a four star or above to come in and contribute right away. You don't give them the leeway necessarily as a fan to say, okay, this is a student athlete. They're, they're going to need to, um, you know, in, in their time here and the time that's invested in them by the coaches and, and the administration, they're going to need to grow as a player. They're going to need to grow as a person. Um, it, you know, we're just not going to see very much of that because a lot of people um, through, through the advent of the, the transfer portal um, and the way that staffs transition, you just, you're, you're, it's very rare to get a guy that sticks around for six years and it's unheard of to hear of, of a guy starting for five uh, but you hear nothing but good things uh, about who he's become and and all of that. And I, I kind of bristle when I hear stuff like that because this has always been him. It's just what, what part of it's winning out, right? Mm -hmm. um, he is older <laughs> and he has, he has less time for the glitz and glam of it, the attention, um, the things that come with just being immature, uh, he, he has aged out of a lot of those things. He has played under several defensive coordinators. He's played under several position coaches. Um, you know, he had that dust up with you, uh, where he was paying a little bit too much attention to what other people had to say. Um, and then I think he kind of got unfairly singled out for doing what anybody else might've done in that situation it's not like i don't keep track of what people say about me it's not like you don't keep track of what people say about you you know um he was proud of a of an arizona state win and and you know he was he was d defending his team in that moment that and and to the thing that i have really enjoyed seeing from him is developing consistency consistency at a position that he had not played prior to arriving at Arizona state, because there are, there are very few players who come to Arizona state at a different position than they originally played that grow uh, into a role where they thrive in that. I mean, Omar Bolden was, was one of them, right? He was a, he was a high school running back if I'm yeah. remembering correctly. And so um, to watch Chase Lucas do that has been pretty special. I had my doubts on his ability to be a hitter. Um, <laughs> That this season he's gotten himself banged up a couple of times, getting a little too into it. I mean, the the way that he enthusiastically gets to the ball, um, just how proud he is to be a Sun Devil, and and how he is toward his teammates, the connection he's kept with his community, and the way he's been able to keep his head, knowing that his closest friends are at the NFL level now and have been for a couple of years. Um, 
all of it is is extremely uh, impressive to me, and I'm I'm very proud of him, and I'm glad that he's he's uh, getting a little bit stronger, and he's gonna be coming back healthy this week. All right. So before the next question, quick follow up, uh, just because one of the most inter- entertaining things he told me that you know, he had a, a bet with his former roommate Frank Darby. They bet five thousand dollars on their respective draft position. Whoever was drafted earlier would collect the bet. Frank Darby, hundred eighty seventh pick last week or last year by the Falcons. Who collects this bet? This well, Chase game. Lucas is probably going to collect on this bet because, the, I mean, before he got banged up the first time this year, you had people giving him a top 20 grade amongst seniors. Not, so that doesn't include anybody who might come out as an underclassman, which means in all likelihood he's probably going to be picked in the in, in the first three rounds if he continues to play uh, the way that he was playing before he went down. So I don't see him lasting till the sixth round unless, you know, come evaluation time, maybe, you know, what we we've seen it happen to plenty of Sun Devils from Terrell Suggs to Jalen Strong, that ultimately their workout number is the thing that, um, the, the thing that ends up costing them. But as long as he puts it together, I, I watched him run a laser timed four, six into the wind at Notre Dame prep as a junior in high school if if he's not at least maintaining four six speed by the time he's 23, 24 years old, there's an issue. So I, I think I think he's gonna be fine. Um, and I definitely think he's not gonna have to worry about falling to the fifth or sixth round. So he should be fine on that bet. So which Sun Devil players through these first seven games have caught your eye the most, whether in a positive or perhaps even a, a negative perspective? Ah oh, man, that's a really good question. <sighs> I have a lot to say about Curtis Hodges, like a lot. Let's hear it. Uh, he's five years into his Sun Devil career, and the thing that I remember most about him is, you know, not a lot of people, even trusted Arizona State media prognosticators, you know, people like that, gave him any chance to stick long term and have any real meaningful impact on this team. I think that there were issues of, um, same with Chase Lucas, there were issues of of, of immaturity, but he's a guy that wanted to be a sun devil so bad. Uh, I remember his senior year of high school, he went to every Arizona state home game and he's hard to miss because he's, you know, six, seven, six, eight standing on the sideline. He gave up basketball to do this standing on the sideline, watching every single game and not every commit comes to every game. You know, the very few do that. He was there for every single game. You could tell he really wanted to be a Sun Devil. When they bounce him back and forth between tight end and wide receiver, that's usually the number one indicator that what somebody's doing is not good because they can't find a position for you. Rarely as an Arizona State fan have you been able to look at a player that's getting bumped to different positions and say like, oh, they're on the path to success. Kalen Balaj is maybe the only one when they were testing him out at outside linebacker to see if he could fill that devil backer role, which, you know, ultimately nothing came of it. But, you know, he's somebody that they couldn't really find a position for. The coach uh, that brought him in, um, I believe Jay Norvell had something to do with that. He's gone, right? Uh, he, he Head coach of Nevada now. And so you know, you look at him and you say, all right, the coach that brought him in is gone. They don't really know what to do with him. He's moving back and forth. They need a tight end desperately in this offense, and 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 nobody's really able to fill that role. Of course, it's not going to be him going into year five. That's why they got Jalen Conyers. That's why they consistently hit up the transfer market. That's why they pulled in somebody from Harvard. And wouldn't you freaking know it? He is out there. And he has guys like uh, Yogi Roth and other people who are who are, who are doing commentary calling him a pro prospect all yeah. of a sudden. And I just want Arizona State Sun Devil fans and people on message boards and everything, just bottle that. Just remember that sometimes it takes time. Not everybody's ready in year one or year two. Like, this is actual development business. It takes time. You got to stick with some of these people. And it's why I get frustrated when coaches push guys out the door uh, because they weren't the ones to recruit them or they might not necessarily know what to do with them yet. Sometimes it takes a while. Gary Chambers was one of those guys. There's an, Mike Bercovici was one of those guys. Sometimes you need to be in the program for a while. You need to mature. You need to figure things out. And, and you know, this idea of, you know, if if I don't see you playing in the next year, then you you should go somewhere else where you see yourself on the field. 
No, if you really have confidence in yourself as a coach, you should be telling these players, I'm the coach for you. I'm here to develop you. But so many coaches talk a big game about their ability to develop, but really all they're doing is taking credit for people who were ready made when they came in the first place, ready to go. Um, so Curtis Hodges is somebody that's kind of been on my mind this year. The other one is Tyler Johnson, because for some reason, uh, without ever having a full off season of actually doing the stuff that you're supposed to do <laughs> at Arizona state, working with, in the weight room with coach Cosgrove. And, you know, he's always been a little bit banged up and waffling between will I, and won't I play football? Uh, he is still some of the time just unblockable. At a position, that, again, he he didn't even play up until recently. You know, he went from being someone who told college coaches who, when they were trying to recruit him, that he was a, a wide receiver and not a tight end, to committing to Arizona <laughs> State as an outside linebacker, and but having Todd Graham compare him to like Charles Clay at the time, um, who was like an H back tight end type, and then even Billy Napier switched him over. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Billy Napier before he left switched him over to tight end just for a few practices, just to see what they would get out of him. If they did move him, they, they ended up sticking with him on defense. He medically retires. You know, one of the things he told me when he did that was he watched Herm Edwards hobbling around after knee replacement. And he said that I don't want that to be me. You know, he really, really likes fire science. He really, really likes, you know, working on the fire. I'm, I'm sure he's going to uh, uh, work as a first responder, a fireman for, for a very, very long time. You can tell that's where his focus is. And I've often long questioned whether or not he loves the game of football, which is not a character issue. A lot of people don't like the game of football. For a lot of people, it's a means to an end. Most business majors in college aren't big fans of just the blanket term business, right? They have niche <laughs> specific things that they're interested in. It just so happens that Tyler Johnson is so naturally talented that it might not matter. He's probably going to end up in the NFL just like his dad was. And then it's, you know, what what are you going to make of that? He's a fascinating character. I've been rooting for him for the last eight years. I want absolutely spectacular things for him, but I wouldn't be lying if I didn't say that the, the his entire journey is so fascinating to me because everything that he's accomplished, he's done so without without being like without and not to say that he's not all in but without also being in the process of being all in like again a full off season weight program been at ASU for 5 years and that's never worked out for him because of injury or, or or other reasons or anything so it is just incredible to watch him be good at whatever he does no matter what and and I wonder if if in the process if he's going to fall in love with football and see how far it can take him or if he's just going to be one of those guys that sticks around you know tempe working in the community helping people out being a first responder just being an all-around great guy that people are able to you know reflect back on a really really unique uh arizona state sun devil career so so far this season and even in the last couple of years we've seen asu be such a markedly different team within the confines of sun devil stadium versus on the road and you look at the two, the three road games that ASU's played this year, two raucous environments in the Provo and Salt Lake City, and then kind of a UC expected kind of, you know, the, the more passive crowd at the Rose Bowl. Um, obviously, you know, th those two up in Utah were really just kind of in a category uh, all their own. Some people are saying that's clearly the reason why ASU becomes so undisciplined, so many penalties, you know, 16 penalties, 13 penalties. Uh, they still made some sloppy mistakes, though, against the Bruins. They're able to get away with that. Why do you feel that, you know, over the last few years, especially perhaps most pronounced this year, ASU is such a different team versus home and a road? I wish I knew. I really do. Um, there are certain things that you, you see on the road that aren't indicative of who Herm Edwards was when he first came in, you know, saying that nothing travels better than a defense and a run game, you know, I think this is a wild speculation, but Jaden Daniels is so good that I think sometimes it's possible to get antsy not making use of his talents. When they went into Salt Lake City against Utah, and I know that this is counterintuitive to what people saw on the screen, but stick with me, it's my opinion. They should have gone in there with the Marshawn Lynch attitude of run through an MFer's face. Period. That second half, it there should have been no no way to even false start 
because every single time they're rotating three running backs that can go through the tackle every once in a while running a play action, but maybe having that play action turn into a rollout in which Jaden Daniels takes off. Keep the ball out of Utah's hands and run the football. Eliminate opportunities to even make mistakes because you know that your team, for one reason or another, whether it's an issue of preparation on the coaching staff end, immaturity or uh, incohesiveness um, on, on your offense's end, they continue to make these mistakes. Uh, and so, you know, you're up 21-7, flex. You know, you have somebody down on the ground ready to tap out. That's when you squeeze. And, you know, I did not see that in in the Utah game. I think it's hard for me to blame them for what happened against BYU because I think that it, it there's some things that you can't prepare for. Coming out of a pandemic and walking into a situation where you're in a stadium with a hostile crowd and a bunch of, you know, 24 year old linemen. And I know that some people like to use that as a stereotype, but in the case of this actual BYU team that's out there lining up, the reason that they're four and zero against the PAC 12 is they are more physically mature. They're able to play bully ball against a lot of teams that are not as physically mature and they're doing a really good job of it and they deserve all the credit in the world. But that crowd is what came out and kicked Arizona state's ass. And so once that happened the first time, you'd figure that that would be something that they were prepared for the second time. The lack of discipline is going to be really hard for Arizona state fans to swallow because when you fire a coach to hire a new coach, there shouldn't be such an extreme pendulum effect unless it was the reason that you hired them. So when you got rid of Dennis Erickson, you brought Todd Graham in one of the primary issues with the team was discipline. So he made that something that he uh, considered to be a hallmark of how he would coach. Um, the expectation was that Herm Edwards wouldn't let that fall off. It has, there have been interviews, I believe with you uh, and maybe in one of your sit down series where you talked to Chase Lucas, where he talked about, you know, when Herm Edwards came in, it was all about everybody being able to show their personality. And then Herm Edwards realized pretty quickly that that was going to need to be scaled back because if you give a mouse a cookie, <laughs> they're going to want a glass of milk, right? <laughs> so he he kind of put Arizona State in a situation where um, people were seeing how much they could take, how much they could get away with. So then they had to bring the discipline back outside of football on, you know, on a personal level. And, 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 and that's just something that coaching staffs kind of have to deal with from um, year in, year out. And, and that's fully understandable, but Arizona state fans I've noticed have had a really tough time dealing with the fact that the, the, that the Sun Devils yeah. have moved so far away from the things that they actually enjoyed about the Todd Graham era, um, which was that the, the clean football was being played, uh, and that if you were going to lose, it was just a matter of coaching and talent, you know, and unfortunately for Todd Graham in a lot of those situations, <laughs> it was the coaching, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so now you're in a situation where Arizona State fans feel like this team should be 7-0, and and they should, you know, they really should. They, they were much better than BYU, and they had uh, Utah on the ropes. And so you know, when, you, when you look at that, and then you have to, you have to find some way to wrap your mind around the idea that they're not seven and zero, while carrying the understanding that this program's probably in trouble for some stuff that happened off the field. And it's just, it's, it's not, those tastes aren't mixing. It's not something that they can swallow and keep down and, and, and them not keeping it down is what you're seeing a lot of on the internet <laughs> over the last week with, you know, people just kind of emoting and expressing how they feel. Over the summer, you, you came over, we had Chili, we had Cody Cameron, we had a, a, an amazing roundtable podcast about the state of Arizona, or, you know, kind of just kind of recruiting the state of Arizona, but, but uh, you know, obviously through the lens, uh, primarily of Arizona State. Not long after that, the kind of, the world kind of blew up with the, the, the news of the NCAA investigation, everything kind of, you know, thrown apart. Obviously, ASU is feeling that really hard right now. Just five public verbal commits as of right now. A number of high-profile decommits. It looks like this is going to be a black cloud that's going to be hanging for you know a little bit, if not for uh, quite some time. ASU might need to go to the portal to cobble together this class, maybe junior college ranks, which we really haven't seen 
uh, under Herm Edwards too much. Right now, what, how would you evaluate kind of the state of ASU recruiting? What kind of things should fans ex- expect or what things could ASU even do to try maybe try to mitigate this damage in the, as, as long as this black cloud continues to hover over the program? Well, I don't, I don't think the right thing to do um, is lock Arizona State into marginal Power 5 talents who would simply be taking advantage of the fact that Arizona State is their best option, have them sign on the dotted line in the early signing period in December, then potentially have the whole coaching staff dismissed and 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 be put in a situation where you have a bunch of kids who are don't know who they're going to be playing for and might not have even been recruited by that staff. So the best thing that this coach can do for the health and future of the program, especially considering they might not all be here next year, is to make sure that they're not taking on anybody who who isn't going to contribute in the future. And I know that there's a, a, a few hundred Arizona State fans who have seemed to um, – latch on to the, to the belief that that I think the Arizona State should just take people from the state of Arizona just because they were born there or played high school football there. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. If you ever listen to me on this show, read anything that I've written ever, you get the best players available to you, period. It does not matter where they're from. It doesn't matter. However, however, you should not ever be in a position where people question whether or not you've done all you can to be as thorough as possible. And that's always been Arizona State's biggest issue. And it's not Herms. And it's not Antonio Pierce's. This is a longstanding thing. When 30 or 40 high school coaches all tell me, these are the five things that Arizona State could be doing better so that I'm not always bitching about the way that Arizona State recruits. And then I relay those things. And then people get upset at me, but then Doug Holler writes an article just making sure that those coaches are anonymous and they say the exact same things. And then people turn around and they bitch at Doug Holler. Like, no guys, this is, there's a, there is a way that people think and you can blame everybody else for the way that they think and say that they're wrong, but you can't change how somebody feels about a situation. And if they're giving you the roadmap on how to do better, take some of the steps. That's all you got to do. That's it. Did you see how much, I mean, over the top, ridiculous praise there was for Jed Fish? You had to have seen it. Everybody had to have seen it. It was hilarious because he hadn't done anything other than come in, find out what everybody's complaints about Arizona State were, and then start doing those things. Holding Zoom calls, making sure he knew some of these people on a first-name basis, inviting people out to games, following up with the kids so it's not just lip service, it's not just PR. Um, but then, you know, come to find out there's not a lot of talent on the field for University of Arizona and they're going to lose every game. So it doesn't, it doesn't, at the end of the day, you still have to perform, but it's not an either or proposition. You could be good at recruiting and you could be thorough. You can also be a good football coach of a talented roster, right? It, it would not take much for Arizona state to start getting effusive praise from all of these high school coaches and high school kids around the Valley and it wouldn't even have to involve making committable offers to them. It would just have to be, let them know where they stand, let them know who you are and your identity and what you need to become to wear the maroon and gold. And unfortunately, this is an issue that's probably being punted to the next coaching staff that's going to come in. As far as the overall state of recruiting, it's going to be really, really hard to figure out what type of continuance They have, because let's say that some of the coaches that are on paid leave right now decide to discuss in great detail why they're on paid leave. Because to be very clear, Arizona State has not interviewed these coaches. Arizona State does not want to interview these coaches. Arizona State, based on the report that they got on the dossier or whatever, The dossier that they got, they told the coaches that were mentioned by name that they were on paid leave. They're not going to interview them because interviewing them could reveal more incriminating evidence that they would then have to take action on. So the best thing that they could do right now, put people on paid leave, tell them to be quiet, 
wait for the NCAA to come in and react to new information as they get it. So Arizona State's not investigating this. And if anybody's told you that Arizona State's investigating this, they're not. They're reacting to the information that they have. If the NCAA comes in and they interview these coaches and they and these coaches decide to say, like, you know, it wasn't our idea. Or I'm the one that stole Jaden Daniels' mom's credit card, assuming that she's telling the truth and there was credit card fraud done with her uh with with her credit card let's say that one of them owns up to that and then they implicate somebody else that coach is gone and let's say that that coach doesn't want to uh be the only one then whoever they implicate is gone and the whole thing could turn into a giant like domino mess and then if any of it ends up being true you have to worry about how principled Michael Crow is going to be in the moment based on all of his past statements uh, that have been relayed by people like Hode Rubino at Devil's Digest as far as how um, how Michael Crow used to interact with Todd Graham. Like, you, you cheat, you're gone. Right? So there's a really good chance that none of these coaches are even going to be here to recruit. So when you ask me what the state of recruiting is overall, I would say that it's, it's essentially non-existent. Anybody that's currently committed to Arizona State verbally is a bonus, but you can't count on it. You got to make sure that they sign. And even then with the transition in coaching staff, you have to figure that the NCAA and the way that it's trending, there'll be some leniency on people who want to try to move off of any written agreements that they make. And then if you're on the team, you have to worry about what happened when Herm Edwards came in because you have carte blanche to straight up cut kids, which is what Herm Edwards did when he came in. He took somebody who had been committed to Arizona State since eighth grade and Lauren Monty and said, we don't see a future for you here. You can keep your scholarship, which he did and, and completed his degree at Arizona State, um, or you can go play football elsewhere. And coaches have the ability to do that as well. And so, you know, if the coaching staff does, if the coaching staff does come back, then you can probably assume that the, the Arizona state will be one of the hottest spots for anybody who is in the transfer portal and attempting to uh, get immediate playing time on the defensive line at linebacker at corner uh, and potentially at quarterback. So, um, all is not lost. If that sounds like it was a lot, it is. Uh, but <laughs> with the transfer portal, you don't necessarily, the transfer portal is like a fully loaded magazine, right? Re reloading is just one simple motion. And I know that because I shot my first gun this weekend. I would not have known what I was talking about prior <laughs> to this weekend. But but it, it re reloading is not as hard as it once was because you don't have to worry about just pulling from the high school ranks anymore. And if you bring in coaches with the type of connections that you might need, or who might've been moved on from another place where they had connections with some of the recruits from that school, those people can just bounce right on over. And so I think Arizona state ultimately, as far as the overall roster, they'll be able to put a decent product on the field next year, no matter who's coaching or playing the Pac-12 South still going to be wide open. Utah is going to be even better than they are this year, next year. But other than that, there's no guarantee for anybody else. No one else in the South. And University of Arizona, God bless them, they're probably three years away. You know? So I, I would not I would not be too worried if you're an Arizona State fan on, on the ability to procure talent because the NCAA has opened up so many avenues to make that possible. Now, of course, you cover the Pac-12 so well with George Reister on uh, Unafraid Show. Pac-12 Apostles is an essential weekly listen. Uh, so let's talk about, as we wind down here, some of the things. Yeah, obviously, Arizona, 19 straight losses. You talked about Jed Fish, you know, doing some right things from a PR perspective, you know, at least drumming up some interest, but just <laughs> the results aren't there. Losing the NAU, mm -hmm. just being really non-competitive. What do you make of the ongoing Arizona Wildcat disaster? Well, they were all, they were always going to be bad. Um, they were competitive in a couple of games last year, and I think a couple of people thought to themselves, "Well, if we were competitive in a couple of games last year, and it was just a matter of quitting on Kevin Sumlin, then somebody who comes in and brings the energy and gets everybody to buy in and has a, a, a hashtag catchphrase." and all that stuff, then then he'll at least be able to make sure that they don't quit. So they should be competitive in most games. But I don't think those people were taking a really close look at what the what was available to them on the roster. There are probably four players that start for 
University of Arizona right now on the defensive side of the ball that should be getting any playing time at the power five level. Um, and that's not to say that the players that are on the roster right now won't grow into those roles. Uh, because like I said earlier, it, sometimes you just have to develop, you know, over time, but as it stands right now, outside of Christian Roland Wallace, um, the big six, six, three thirty uh, nose guard they have um, Jalen Harris and shoot, maybe they they have a pretty decent outside linebacker in, in, coverage but not necessarily in playing the outside of maybe those four guys um it, it's rough they you know that that should not be a team that that is not a team that would win the big sky and we know this because they lost to NAU and there are like seven teams in the big sky that are better than NAU <laughs> uh offensively it's been tough to watch because i do know a lot of these kids i want them to be uh successful they seem to have found somebody they were excited about at the quarterback position in Jordan McLeod because he could extend plays. But even then, if you look at what he actually produced on the field, you're looking at a five interception game. And that's what they were excited about. Um, now they're in a position to potentially need to play Jamari Joyner at quarterback, which Arizona State fans remember Jamari Joyner and the all-time stunt he pulled by taking an official visit to ASU after he had already signed with the University of Arizona. Uh, but he is one of my absolute favorite kids. He's probably the best athlete on that team, arguably one of the better athletes in the entire Pac-12 South, I'd say top three. And the idea that they would not be able to employ him as a wide receiver because they don't have the quarterback talent to get him the ball and that they would have to take him out of that altogether and pull like an Anquan Bolden with Chris Ricks situation and have him play quarterback for a couple of games. That's just like, that's disgusting. I don't want to see that. Um, I have a really hard time watching their their games at all. They just in the trenches. Yeah, they they had one player, one player that made any Pac-12 all honorable. Lucas Haversick was it their punter or kicker? Either way, he's been benched. Um, there's just nothing, and and the, I mean, and the fact that they still almost beat Washington is unreal. Uh, I think Jed Fish is doing some good things. I laughed at his hiring. I was the most disrespectful I've ever been about any hiring toward his hiring. Um, and I've actually really liked a lot of the things that he's done. And I do see the team getting better and I do see them fighting, but you see it taking a lot out of him every single week. Like he should know he's been around some very good teams. He should know that this was going to be an uphill battle. And he's out there looking like urban Meyer after every loss with Jacksonville. Like it's just taken the life force out of him. Um, you just got to be able to stick it through this season and they will incrementally get better. I had them win in two games this year, but I don't know if I have them win in two games with the rest of this year and next year combined based on the way things are going. And if he can weather the storm, this... <laughs> what? <laughs> I was say, does the streak end this year or is it, is that a 20? I mean, and their non-con next year is not easy. Like San Diego state, we missed no. state and uh, North Dakota state too. Yeah, if we could just stop as a conference scheduling San Diego State, that'd be fantastic. And then you want to add North Dakota State on top of all that? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, it, it could definitely be a while. And I know the Arizona State fans are really enjoying it. Um, there's going to be a lot more to enjoy. I think that if they have patience and they stick with him through the long term, uh, you will see improvement. I mean, you have to because you can't – the one win would be – would be improvement. But the, the fact of the matter is I listen to the hard edge football podcast. It's a uh, rich rod and his daughter. It is fantastic. I don't care what you think of rich rod. His daughter is the host. She asks incredible questions. He's absurdly Frank for a division one uh, offensive coordinator to be having his own show and the stuff that he says, and he doesn't really get into it too much, but you can tell like he, he, there are things that he doesn't say about that university of Arizona job of like what it takes to win down there is just different. It's different than most other markets. Um, and the thing that you need to get people excited down there, and, and I know that I've been accused of being uh, a, a, a Khalil Tate super fan, but take a look at what they were with him and what they are without him. And that's the truth. You need a you need a, a, a very good, if not transcendent athlete to be taking snaps at the quarterback position to make up for a lot of the other deficiencies that your team might have 
Um, and that's what will keep you competitive. And uh, it is, it, it, it's been about 18, 19 years since they've had a year this bad. Um, but uh, it's only up from here, I guess. It's just how far up will it take to actually win a Pac-12 game? And I'm worried that that's too far for, for the way this roster is constructed. Now, I've got a, you know, one sentence real quick, you know, uh, lightning round, because there's been a lot of online speculation. You see what's happening with an Arizona kid and, Ar- and Spencer Rattler. You see the situation down in, in Arizona. Some, a lot of folks out there connecting the dots. Should they? Mm-hmm. No, no, not at all. He won't come back. Um, Kyle Allen, uh, who left the state of Arizona to go to Texas A&M, transferred to Houston, got beat out by De'Eric King, and then declared. That's the model. There's no reason for Spencer Rat. He's in his third year. He is allowed under the rules to declare for the NFL draft. There's no reason for him to transfer anywhere unless he thinks he can build his way up to be a first round pick, but that won't be at Arizona. So there's, he would never come back. No way. All right. So as we, as we wind down here, just, this is a question that obviously week by week changes so drastically uh, as we record this and I should time date it, you know, it's uh, Monday, the 25th, about eight thirty. Who's the Pac-12 favorite? Who's the Pac-12 front runner right now? Oh my gosh! It's like it's <laughs> it's Arizona State, it's Utah, it's Oregon. Why not Oregon State? The Beavs are taking like it, this is in terms of a conference that is annually very unpredictable. This just might be one of those special years, right? I think that um, I think that Arizona State has the best team objectively. Uh, from top to bottom, they have the best team, which is what makes the two losses so far uh, uh, even more frustrating. Now They're at the point right now where they need help, and they're probably going to need that help from a uh, a team that is on their second-string quarterback in UCLA. Ethan Garbers is extremely talented, and Utah can't stop the run. So UCLA might pull it off if they just go into Salt Lake and they give them a, a heavy, heavy dose of Charbonnet. Uh, then then you might actually see Arizona State get another opportunity uh, to try and finish this off. But if you're an Arizona State fan, do you have faith that they can go to Pullman uh, or not Pullman? If, do you have faith that they can go into Corvallis in, in November against a very, very uh, talented Oregon State team and, and win? And I would say that if UCLA can beat Utah, then that's what it comes down to for me is either Arizona State or Oregon State. Whichever one of those teams wins in November, assuming they don't lose any other games, I believe would have the leg up to beat a very flawed Oregon team with a very limited offense. With C.J. Verdell, Oregon's the best team in the Pac-12. Without him, without Travis Dye being able to run through the tackles, without any of their receivers having more than like 15 receptions on on the season. And I know Arizona State fans feel that pain. Um, And with Anthony Brown not being somebody who can just go out and win a game by himself, that offense is not going to be good enough to keep escaping by the skin of their teeth every single week. And I think that Arizona State would be in the best position to potentially beat them in a Pac-12 championship game because I think Utah is still a year away or potentially Oregon State if they can keep uh, if they can keep this going and the Washington State game was just a fluke then 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 we might find out that this is a really special year for the Beavs and Jonathan Smith might punch his ticket to be the next head coach of USC <laughs> Um, which is which is what I believe that they should do. But uh, I, to me right now, I don't think I, – I think that it would be ridiculous if Oregon backed their way into a Pac-12 championship with a roster this flawed. Uh, and so it really, to me, comes down to, to Arizona State or Oregon State if UCLA can beat Utah. If not, Utah has enough of an advantage where they can just go pedal the metal the rest of the way and potentially win the conference despite – maybe having their least talented roster in the last six, seven years. All right. So last question for you. And so we got to save the most gossipy scandal ridden question. There's obviously okay. two current uh, head coach openings. You, you kind of alluded to it. You know, you're kind of pro Jonathan Smith, to USC. So obviously USC Washington state have openings for a head coach. So I'm going to add a third team to this list. If, and when, the Arizona State job opens up. 
So mm -hmm. as we get out of here, just give me a, a name or two for each of those jobs that you think would be a great fit. Or even if, if you don't have a necessary name, maybe a, a profile of the type of coach that would work for those three schools. Okay. So at Washington State, Jake Dickert has taken over. Uh, there are a lot of guys that have worked as, uh, for Craig Bowl at Wyoming as the defensive coordinator uh, who have gone on to have a lot of success. He could be the most recent one. He's kind of a, a, a breath of fresh air for that administration based on everything they just went through with Nick Rolovich. It is very possible that if they have some level of sustained success, go to a bowl, maybe win it, that Jake Dickert takes over. If not, I really like Jay Norvell at Nevada. I think that that would be a, yeah. a good job for him. Um, a really good job. If USC does the smart thing, which would be to try to throw the bag at, at, at Jonathan Smith with USC being able to essentially recruit itself, maybe keep Dante Williams on staff. Please unblock me, Dante. Um, if they keep Dante Williams on staff and they have Jonathan Smith running that offense, they're going to be really, really hard to stop. And I think Oregon State would already have a built-in replacement in Brian Lindgren who could step in and take over as head coach. So that would leave Arizona State. My issue with Arizona State is if they're not going to have Herm Edwards retire or rebrand, whatever it is, the way that he called the investigation or review, you know, they'll find some word that isn't actually the word for what's going on. Um, but when they do that, will it be with Ray Anderson or not? And I think that that's incredibly important because if they clean house completely, then the next athletic director might come in looking for Fred Rogers or, you know, Rules McGee or some, like literally just anybody who's going to come in and make sure that, that nothing happens within the program that isn't, you know, every uh, uh, I dotted, every T crossed. Because you have to remember that if this stuff is true, the there's there's an issue within Arizona State because the compliance people at Arizona State, it's their job to make sure this doesn't happen. And they're going to be the ones that feel super betrayed and made to look like fools and feel like they didn't do their job correctly. So if, if it's not Ray Anderson and it's somebody else in the athletic director role and they try to get someone super squeaky clean, I don't even know who that is would be and that's that's the really tough thing for me to prognosticate there's names out there that that feel sexy like i wanted them to hire billy napier uh to replace todd graham in in the first place ray anderson just wanted napier to stick around without a promotion you know so i don't see him coming back to work for ray anderson um danny gonzalez is finally making some headway at his alma mater you know could they lure him away from new mexico probably uh, but there are a couple of guys who who I really like, just regardless, as football minds, one of which is Michigan State defensive coordinator Scotty Hazelton. He is one of those um, Craig Bowl defensive coordinators that, that I had previously brought up. Um, other than that, I mean, th they have somebody on the staff right now who is incredibly impressive to me, and that is defensive line coach uh, Robert Rodriguez. I think he would make for a fantastic head coach. I like everything about him, his vibe, all that, but you don't know if it's one of those things where the stink of this staff touches everybody, you know? Um, so th th those are some names. I have an easier time filling in the gaps for all the other schools uh, than I do with Arizona State because I just don't know who would be making that decision. And if it's, um, you know, if it's, if it, it, depending on any athletic director that would come in, you would expect them to maybe do the same thing that Ray Anderson did, which is dip into the, into the old Rolodex and, 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 and call <laughs> up a, a good buddy because that's how this game is run. That's how this business is run is, is, uh, is a little bit of a little bit of collusion and a little bit of nepotism. And, and that's, that's how most coaches uh, end up getting the jobs that they get. So it really just depends on who's left over to make the pick, but, Napier, Rodriguez, uh, Hazelton. Those are a few names that I really like. Well, Ralph, it Kalen is DeBoer for Fresno absolute... State. If you're feeling frisky, okay. So that was actually what I was I was debating. Like uh, I've already kept him so long. Do I bring this up? Because that's a name that's been floating in my mind. Kind of just an <laughs> offensive mind, and like I think ASU, no matter what, needs to go the route of just like an offensive mind. Because even in the down years, they can always they've always been able to get playmakers. At least be interesting, innovative even if you're not necessarily overly successful if, you know, something happens over the next few years. So I'm glad you brought that up. Hey, and maybe maybe USC will mess up and hire James Franklin or something, and Jonathan Smith will be available. 
You never know. <laughs> uh, well, Ralph, always an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you. Uh, you know, for anybody who, you know, every podcast is somebody's first. So uh, if you could let our listeners and viewers know, how can they keep up with all the awesome stuff that you do? Um, so I co-host the Pac-12 Apostles podcast with George Reister, who used to play for the Jaguars. Um, you don't have to like him if you're an Arizona State fan. He's a duck homer, and he did the nuclear bomb tweet, which was very bad. Uh, but he is bad really good at what he too. does. Bad candy takes, absolutely. But uh, he, he's a good man, and uh, we got John yes. Wilner on the podcast tomorrow. We had George Klyavkov nice. a couple of weeks ago. We've had half the Pac-12 head coaches, which is insane. Um and uh, we actually broke the news of the Pac-12 uh, <laughs> conference commissioner hiring, uh, which was pretty weird. Um, but w I, I feel like we're we're, we're making a, a, a fun podcast to listen to and would love to have uh, Arizona State fans aboard if for no other reason than to just message George and let him know uh, <laughs> that he's off base on most of the things that he's talking about, including Arizona State most of the time. Um and then Arizona Varsity, if, you, if, if you're into Arizona high school football, the local stuff, I have a really great staff, Cody Cameron, Chili, guys who just uh, could, could not be any more close to the action, um, couldn't, couldn't do a better job, honestly. They're, they're fantastic, and it is a privilege to work with them. Uh, and then if you want to uh, uh, find me, I'm always very online, uh, at Ralph Amston, and uh, I will gladly chop it up with you, especially – especially <laughs> if you say that you heard something I said on speak of the devils, because this is, this is my favorite non-movie podcast. And I think, you know what we're talking about <laughs> the other podcast I'm talking about. This is my, this is my favorite show. And I love the chemistry that you and Joe have. And I've been listening for a whole decade. And the idea that I've been on this show once uh, much less almost 40 times is, um, uh, yeah. It is something that, that, that makes me feel really, really good every single time. So I appreciate anybody who listens to this show and gets a hold of me through <laughs> um, that medium because this is, this is definitely my favorite thing to do is, is jump on here with you guys. Well, yeah, as I said, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. So uh, I promise it won't be, you know, seven months or, you know, uh, three months into seven games into a season, three months, whatever. We'll, we'll definitely have you back on much sooner. Uh, folks, like and subscribe here on you, the YouTube channel, of course. Give us a five-star review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice.